Welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Bryn Adams, joined by a man who also gave away $1,000 worth of video games this year. If by video games you mean mustache rides, it's Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren! (laughs) Getting risque in the intro, Brent. Well, you know, it's getting to be that time of year. It is the, the it, it, what mustache ride time of year. Well, no, it's it's that time of year when everything gets get, gets all wholesome and everything, and I, I start to feel uncomfortable with myself. So you have to push back. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought you were going to say uh, that I gave away a thousand dollars in video games. If by that you meant that I gave a thousand dollars to video game companies for games that don't work. A thousand dollars on games that don't work because it feels so- like it. Some might call into question whether or not this hobby is worth it to you anymore. <laughs> um, uh, how are you, my friend? Are you enjoying your what will soon be a white Christmas? Oh wait, no, there's no snow in there's this no part snow. of the country. No, it's been uh, it's actually been uh, been very nice here. We had uh, we had we were like in the 60s last week, but raining. But then over the weekend, like we got up into the low 70s. And it was kind of sunny, like we got to go to the park and take Z to the playground and stuff. It was good times. Yeah, this whole part of the country is going to be without a white Christmas. Uh, it's okay. There, 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 there are worse things. There are. <laughs> we, there we, are. Could, we could have like that. Uh, we could have like that ice storm thing that we had. I can't remember how many years ago it's been. Now we were like buried under two feet of snow and ice for a week. That that I could do without. I was kind of waiting for the blizzard to hole up with my games. Maybe finish The Witcher three in like a power weekend. That would be a good excuse, uh, though. Uh? Speaking of this time of year, I guess we ought to go ahead and just talk very briefly about the show schedule for the rest of the year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's um, right. So, obviously, we're on this week, and then uh, next week, we are we are going to have a show. That's going to be our Game of the Year show, and then we're going to be taking a week off after that. So, uh, Tuesday, December the 29th. 29th, no show that week, and then we'll be back again uh, at the first of the year. So, yep. those are the announcements, and I guess with that, let's go ahead and get into the garage and start uh, talking about some some game stuff. First off, for those of you who are on the PC and wanted to know when you were going to get your Rise of the Tomb Raider on, the answer is soonish. January 29th has uh, has been revealed as the uh, the launch day for. PC version of Rise of the Tomb Raider, of course, uh, the PS4 version is still quite a ways away, isn't it, Lauren? Uh, yeah, it's supposed to be the end of 2016. So I saw this announcement and thought, well, this is great. I can, I can. Uh, it comes out on January 29th. I'll wait two months. I'll be able to pick it up for 15 bucks, and Squeenix yep. will have done a great job at releasing their game. <laughs> yes, they will. They certainly will have. They, they will in no way get punished for. For the timed exclusivity of a third-party AAA game, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. Uh, you know, uh, it's getting pretty. It's getting good reviews, Brent. I, you know, I don't know. I didn't love the first one. I, I, uh, the first one. By first one, I mean the last one, the first reboot. But yeah. uh, um, I didn't love it. I liked it, um, but I didn't love it. It was, and uh, I felt like there was a lot of room to improve. It mm. looks like it's a it's very very similar. I, I don't know. Um, I haven't done a lot of reading about it, but it's been well reviewed. And so for me, I don't know that it's a full price game, um, but I am looking forward to playing it. And, and this is great for me because I, this is a game I'm totally fine waiting for. And, and seriously, by Mar- March or April, it, I, you'll probably be able to pr- pick it up in a spring sale for you know fifteen for twenty bucks. Much. Yeah, I don't know about fifteen or twenty, but it will be cheaper. I think it's going to be more like you know 40 35 or 40 if you're lucky but anyway yeah possibly i guess if you uh, if you were to get it from green man gaming but yeah i don't do that anymore that, kind of, that <laughs> look how it worked out for you last time they've been literally deleted from my bookmarks uh those of you who are interested might also want to know that uh, the pc release again on january 29th 2016 uh is uh, going to put uh, the pc release alongside the release of the Baba Yaga DLC for Rise of the Tomb Raider, which is also scheduled for that month. Um, I guess we should also say that this is not, at least as of the recording, it could have changed by the time the show actually makes it out. But as we are recording this, this has not been officially released. This uh, comes to us by way of an IGN article that cites Amazon France, uh, which is listing the release date as January 29th. So uh, we should just put that caveat on and say this is subject 
to change or official confirmation. Yeah, but the French take this shit very seriously. I don't think they. I don't think they mess around with this. I mean, who? Yes. <laughs> Almost as seriously as they take their meat eating. <laughs> they like eating meat in France, at least according to that one episode of uh, Gordon Ramsay's show that I watched. Not a lot of vegetarians in France, he, he claims. Uh, moving on. Here's an interesting story. This is the first time that I've been reading about this game, Lauren. Um, but uh, we've got a Eurogamer article about a title in development now called Way to the Woods which is described as a crossover between journey and the last of us without the violent parts of the last of us. Well, that's kind of this. So this kid who's one of the developers, he's 16 years old. Anthony uh, Tan has said that that's what they're going for is, is a, yeah. is, is a cross between the last of us and journey, which, uh, <laughs> which I think is just fantastic. And I, and the fact that it's a 16 year old kid saying it makes it even that much better. It is interesting. It's a very striking looking game too. It it, it has kind of a a, a very painterly, almost uh, cell shaded uh, kind of art design sensibility to it. The 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 broad strokes of what the game is about is it's an adventure about two deer in a strange place, and I do mean double deer. e deer. <laughs> yes. um, Makes me think of the Oh Deer Diner from uh, from Alan Wake. Indeed. But anyway, it's uh, it's an interesting little write up here, and uh, as I said, this is the first time I'm I'm hearing about it, and it is definitely something to keep your eye on if you are interested in that more off the beaten path kind of game experience. Yeah, it looks interesting. I, I have a feeling we're going to be hearing more about this game. It's it's um, uh, I've seen a couple articles about it now, and it's a little indie game, but it looks gorgeous, sounds very interesting, and uh, I think it's got the attention of, of members of the industry itself with developers. And so I think we're going to be Sean hearing- Murray of uh, no man's sky fame on Twitter called it quote, the most gorgeous thing you'll see today when he linked to it. I think that's pretty presumptuous of Sean to make that statement about my wife. <laughs> Lauren's wife is standing in the room. You guys don't know. But <laughs> uh, Brent, the third Lauren's story, go- he's going for a thousand and one dollars. If you get my meaning, the, uh, the third story, Brent, did you know about this before seeing this story? Uh, about the um, dialogue options? Uh, yeah, I read something about it. Um, uh, apparently, it was announced a while ago, but I was not aware of it. Well, it was it was announced at the PlayStation Experience thing, right? A PSX, or yeah. Whatever. And I don't remember hearing anything about it. Do you, I, I don't. I remember reading something about it, but um, oh, I, well, no, okay. Like I just like I think I saw it like in a headline, but didn't actually read the story. One of those days. But anyway, for, uh, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, Uncharted 4 is going to have some dialogue options. And the instance that, that they point to is that it gives the player the option to kind of, quote, start the story however you want. And so... Did you watch the video or did you choose not to because you wanted no, to? I, I, I have not watched the video and it's, just, and it's just basically like, I don't need to see anything on Uncharted 4. Like, I'm going to buy the game and I kind of want to just be virgin going into it. So I, I'm not, I'm uh, not okay, watching the video. Let's not set our expectations well, too high. Well, did, uh, well, okay. Now in the video, do like, you do they, have a daughter. They show the, it to you. They outright show it to you. Okay. So, so <laughs> how, so tell me about it. How does it go? So, and, and I'm, I was kind of bummed that I watched it. Although it's cause if I got into the game without even knowing this existed, um, I think it would have been kind of interesting, but uh-huh. knowing it exists. And this is a potential spoiler for those of you that really want to not hear anything about it. Just so you know, but so, Basically, they show, and I don't know if this is all going to be this way, but they show um, Sam and Nate talking, yeah. and you know Sam makes a comment like, "Yeah, it's been a you know a long road, huh, brother?" And, and you have three choices, and you can either say, um, "Yeah, I fa- I can't even remember the names of the thing. I found the dagger at so and so, I found the coin at so and so, and one refers to Uncharted One, one refers to Uncharted Two, Uncharted Two, uh, or one refers to Uncharted, Uncharted Three. It's like three. an artifact from each each one of them. And so yeah. when you read the article, he says, you know, um, he says like there's long been an argument about which was the better game or something. And so I, I think there's, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if it's just going to be a series of. Well, that's which, not that's so, not really true though. I mean, Uncharted Two is the better game. There's no argument. I've so. never heard anyone say anything other than that either, frankly. But. Yeah. Um, right. I don't know if they're all going to be that way. So if they're all like, 
you could pick one from column A for Uncharted One. Column B is Uncharted Two, and col- or not even column, but yeah. like you know, Selection Three is Uncharted Three, or if it's just a sample. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, so I kind of like. And does that substantively impact the game, or is it just? I don't. My is guess it just is that moment. Or? Yeah, my guess is it doesn't substantively impact it. But uh, you know, at first I thought, oh, this is really. I didn't know anything about this going into it. This article, so I thought, oh, this is interesting. Like, not that I, I like the idea that they're not changing like the foundation of uncharted to make it a mass effect because it's not that's not that game you know what i mean and so the idea that it uh i like the idea that the the game isn't all of a sudden going to have dialogue options but in certain scenes they feel like they could be useful now yeah um i still am kind of interested to see how they're implemented though because they could create some really interesting and funny moments yeah potentially it's just i, I don't know like i i'm i'm kind of curious to see how it feels like when you're actually playing the game with you know, just kind of the pacing and the flow and everything. I mean, like, uh, you know, like a game like Mass Effect being a role playing game and going through conversations, you know, gleaning information and sort of advancing the, you know, like the personal stories or, or the relationship stories. It's part and parcel of that experience. And Uncharted has been a very different kind of game in terms of its pacing and, and being more adventure focused. And I'm just, I'm wondering. I'm just wondering what that's going to feel like, you, yeah. you know, kind of slowing down for dialogue options in the middle of a cutscene. Just that I don't, I, I, don't I don't get the sense that it's going to. I don't. I don't get the sense. I don't think it'll affect pacing too much. I really don't. Yeah. I, I and I and honestly, I'm not sure how much it will add to the game. I think to you know not have only seen having only seen a snippet of it. I think where it might add to the game is to to give funny dialogue options. So if he says something funny based on what you've chosen. You might kind of want to like go back and replay that so you can hear like what smart ass thing does Nate say? Yeah, that could be. If fun, I went definitely. down the Uncharted Three route instead of the Uncharted Two route, like yeah. maybe he makes some comment about Chloe if you talk about one of the games, and he t- makes some comment about Elena if you talk about one of the others, or some point at which you know Sully abandoned him. Or I wonder if they'll give you any dialogue options for the, the those heavy action scenes where where Nate's in cover and people are throwing grenades at him and he's shouting stuff like stop shooting at me <laughs> right, but, but some, yeah, of, some right. of my favorite moments in the game are, are those kinds and one of the things. reasons that we're sort of uh conjecturing here is because i haven't uh, after seeing what i saw i haven't gone and looked up anything else yeah uh because i don't want to spoil it but uh it's, i don't know it'll be interesting to see how they implement it if it actually adds something to the game i don't think it's going to be a big part of the game i think it's just sort of a um you know they saw it feels like anyway from this article they saw an opportunity you know, to maybe do something that was fun or interesting in these little parts, and so they thought they would. Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm all about it. I mean, since they've since they've stated that this is going to be the end of uh, the Nathan Drake uh, series of stories, I'm all about them pulling out all the stops. So, basically, what I'm saying is Nathan Drake with a lightsaber, Uncharted. 4. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Welcome back to the clubhouse. Pull up a chair, grab a frothy beverage of your choosing, and we're going to have a little bit of a discussion. But first, we've got some poll results based on last week's question. Lauren, would you like to go through those? I would love to, Brent. The question was, we were discussing how basically every video game company out there has screwed me personally. Uh... The question was... You were, you were discussing that. I was kind of nodding. That's uh, <laughs> off. Um, <laughs> the question, Brent, that you posed to our listeners well was... Well played. How big a problem have broken games been for you this year? And you had three choices. Coming in last place with 27% of the vote was, it's a problem, but not that widespread. It just inspires such a vocal reaction. Coming right. in in second place with 29% was the correct answer. Uh, how big is the Laurentian abyss? It's a constant issue. And coming in with 44% of the vote, and the number one answer is it hasn't really affected me at all. And so certainly go. this is going to be um, you know, very a very personal thing, whether or not it's affected you. I mean, the three biggies this year were Just Cause 3 on the console, um, Star Wars Battlefront on uh, the uh, PC, we'll talk about that a little bit, and um, uh, Batman Arkham Knight on the PC are sort of the three biggies. Right, um, right, right. So if you didn't get those games on those consoles, you know, if you got all three of those games on those particular um, uh, types of machines, boy, you feel screwed. 
And I okay, <laughs> guess guess who got all three of those games on those particular platforms? That's right. So anyway, yeah. uh, it's a good discussion. Yeah. Uh, hopefully someday game makers will actually release finished games. Uh, and then, yeah, that's what I got for you in the poll, Brent. All right. Thank you very much for that, Lauren. That wasn't uh, biased in any way. <laughs> Not at all. Today, we are going to talk about a, a pair of articles from Polygon that uh, were published, I guess, last week, a little over a week now, that really, really captured my uh, attention, and I thought it would be a fun thing to discuss. What Polygon did is they did a breakdown and kind of a, an evaluation of the free games that you get if you have an Xbox Live Gold membership or a PlayStation Plus subscription. You know, that's one of the big things that they tout. We've talked about it on the show. You sign up with their their paid premium service, and they give you free games each month. And, you know, we've talked about it on the show many times about uh, PlayStation Plus, with which obviously Lauren and I both have, and uh, and snagging some of the free games there. But is it worth it? Is it worth it to have the, the Xbox Live Gold or the PSN Plus? Do, do the free games actually... Do they actually give you anything in return to justify the money that you give to them and how do they stack up against each other so polygon did two articles one detailing microsoft's offerings and the other detailing playstation's offerings and it was very very interesting now they go they go through 2015 they talk about the games that came out every year. They talk about the total, excuse me, they talk about the games that came out every month. So as an example, January, Xbox gave away Dark Dreams Don't Die, MX versus ATV Live, and Witcher 2 Assassination of Kings. Uh, two, uh, the latter two being Xbox 360 games. The first one was an Xbox One game. The average score of those three games, 75.6. Is this, uh, wait, uh, is it Metacritic? I'm assuming it is Metacritic. I would assume so. Lauren can, can look for that while I'm talking. But anyway, so average score of those three games, 75.6. Total value, $64.97. Now, over yes, on the PlayStation. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, over, on the, uh, over on the PlayStation side for January, they gave away Infamous First Light, PS4 game. They gave away The Swapper, Prototype 2, DuckTales Remastered, Duke Nukem 3D, and Woe Dave. And, you know, so like, and everything after Infamous is PS3 or PS Vita. Excuse me, the swapper was also on PS4. Yeah, it is important to note, like, the different, co- you know, consoles. The Xbox had one game on Xbox Ones and two on Xbox 360. Correct. Uh, uh, PlayStation has two PS4s, two, three PS3s, and three PS Vitas. Yeah, excuse me. And uh, so the average score of those games, 76.6. Total value, $93.27. So that's that's how the evaluation goes. They just go through e- each month. They talk about the games that were given away, the consoles they were on, average Metacritic score, and total value of those games. It's very, very interesting to A, B compare these two things because, number one, it speaks to, I think, the inherent sort of differences in the consoles and perhaps also the people who own those consoles, like the kinds of games that they end up being interested in. And when you get to the bottom of the article, they've got, uh, they've got some great data crunching breakdown. So over on the PlayStation side, the average score of all the games they gave away in 2015 was 755 on Metacritic, the average price of those games was fourteen dollars and sixty three cents for a total value of one thousand fifty three dollars and thirty six cents that you got in free games if you were a member of PlayStation Plus during the year two thousand and fifteen. Over on the Microsoft side, average average Metacritic score of their games seventy six, average price twenty dollars and thirty seven cents, total value. $946.53 in free games for Xbox Live Gold members. So I think this is really, really interesting. And the, the, the bottom line that Polygon kind of arrives at is that PlayStation gave away more games and Microsoft gave away slightly better games going by the metacritic score. Yeah, go by by 0. 0.5 though. 75.5 to 76. Yes, it, it's it's not much of a difference, but 
anyway, it 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 is a very very it, it's a a very very fascinating breakdown, especially to look at the kinds of the kinds of games they gave away. Like as an example, the highest rated Xbox 360 game that Microsoft gave away was Bioshock Infinite. The highest rated Xbox One game was Rayman Legends. Over on the PlayStation side, highest rated PS3 game is Mass Effect 2. Highest rated PS4 game was Limbo. So it's interesting, Brent, that the average price for PlayStation was fourteen sixty three. Yep. And the average price for Xbox was twenty thirty seven. That's a significant that's almost a forty five percent higher average price for Xbox. Yep. Yet yet PlayStation had an overall total value of more. So they must have been by about a hundred bucks or so, they must have given away significantly more games. Yeah, I, I mean, most most months, Microsoft's give you know is giving away like three and four games, and PlayStation is giving away five and six. So, dude, I'm looking at the Xbox yeah. One. Screw PlayStation. J- Xbox 360 gets Thief, Just Cause 2, Mafia 2, yeah, Assassin's ba- Creed 4, Black Flag. But bear in mind, they were all released this year for the Xbox 360 console. None of those are Xbox One games. No, those are all 360 games. Yeah, so yeah. that's the thing. You know, they're yes, they're really good games. Oh no, they gave Black Flag to the Xbox One co- family in July. Okay, well, I stand corrected. There's some good. There's some Metro 2033. Jesus, no, there's some th- great games in the Xbox One. There is. There's some fantastic games. Crisis in there. Three, Tomb Raider, the Definitive Edition. Yeah. God damn it! I'm going to sell my PlayStation and get an Xbox. That's that's the thing. I think that what's interesting is that. Microsoft is giving away, in, at least in, in my mind, Microsoft is giving away more established hits. You know, They're giving away big games from big franchises. And it seems almost like Sony is using the free games as a content curation strategy. Right. They go after more. They go, Sony more aggressively goes after indie developers yeah. and gets these amazing, amazing indie titles. It's like uh, they're trying to kind of highlight. Right, like you know, Grow Home, like you know, Transistor, like which I'm not saying is a, that I think is a very stark difference in the strategies that that both companies have on this. Well, yeah. it's very very interesting to just kind of A B compare going month to month and see see what they've given away. Like the highest price Xbox 360 game that was given away was uh, F1 2013, a very fine game by the way for uh, 39.99. The highest price PS3 game was Prototype 2, again 39.99. So anyway, it just it, it, I think that it. It draws some interesting comparison, but it also kind of comes back to this this really cool trend that's happened. Where, I mean, we can all remember a time when you know you were you were basically you were paying for Xbox Live Gold so you could play multiplayer and do chat and all that kind of thing. And then you know PlayStation came along and they uh, they had their free service on PlayStation Three, where you could you could play online for free, you could voice chat for free, but it it lacked the cohesiveness of the Xbox live experience when playstation originally came out with playstation plus everybody was like why would why would anybody pay for this like you're already giving away you're already giving away the goods multiplayer and chat why would anybody need to pay you for a premium service and then you know sony starts giving away these free games microsoft's got the games with gold program it's become this really cool back and forth competitively speaking and we the gamers have won is Basically the bottom line. You know, it's interesting, Brent, because we all talk about how Steam puts stuff on sale all the time and PC games we got on sale, and that's almost never the case or very rarely, although it's starting to happen with uh, increasing frequency on the consoles. But one thing that Steam doesn't do ever is give away games, right? Like Uh, this. Um, Yeah, not like this. No, and I think it's, uh, you know, these these are good games. You know, I really wish this is... I mean, honestly, like, these are fantastic games. It's just that they're a little bit old. It's like... if you're one of those players that doesn't get to everything, like the week it comes out, if you wait a little while, like you really, really can cash in on these two programs. Absolutely, you can. I mean, there's just starting in January, I was looking at the PlayStation. Uh, so, so you know what I would have liked? Was, this is super interesting. I really would have liked, liked to have seen them put this into one article right. and then break it up entirely by platform because most people aren't imbibing this both on 360 and Xbox One or PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 3. People are, but I th- I, my guess is most people have one or the other. Consoles are using primarily one or the other. I could be wrong, and okay. certainly with the exception of the Vita, um, because I would guess most people with the Vita have some sort of PlayStation. But yes. um, looking on the Safe PlayStation, better, I'm thinking, so for me, like from the PS4 standpoint, January was Infamous First Light, which is a phenomenal game. 
The Swapper, which is a phenomenal game. February has Transistor and Apotheon, which is a Transistor, um, you know, could have been my game of the year almost uh, right. last year. Uh, Valiant Hearts, The Great War, and, and The New Oddworld in March. Uh, there's some Never Alone in April, which is a fantastic, really interesting game that I haven't finished. Ether One, <laughs> Guacamelee, which got tremendous ratings in Ether One. My game uh, of the, the year for last year. Ether One, uh, right, mm-hmm. for free. And The Unfinished Swan, which is very well received. Metal Gear Solid Five, Ground Zeroes. I mean, these are these are... Rocket League, of course, which I can't even count yeah. the hours I put into Rocket League. The Rocket League phenomenon. Temple of Osiris, which you, uh, I, which oh, I, 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 I would want to put game. more into. Love that game. Limbo and Sound Shapes and Stealth 2, a game of clones, all super highly uh, rated. This is just PS4 stuff. Grow Home, which I haven't played, but people have told me is phenomenal. Um, super Meat Boy in Octo- came out in October, which is an amazing game in and of itself. And then Broken Age and another one called Unmechanical. I haven't played that. Uh, November, Walking Dead Season 2, Mass Effect, uh, Magicka 2. I mean, there's just, like, it's an insane lineup of games. It um, is. It's, it's totally, it's oh, totally and legit. for December, which I haven't downloaded yet, which I probably should in King's Quest. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, what I really like to see is, like, the Xbox One is compared to the PS4, the 360 compared to the PS3, and then the Vita is sort of its own animal. You know what I mean? I'd like to see where that value is. I'd like to go down those lists and literally look at them side by side and say, Oh, there's all these great games here on PlayStation and not on the Warp Xbox One this month. But look, there's all these great games on the Xbox One this month and necess- not necessarily on the PlayStation. But I think it's super, super interesting to look at these. Um, and I'll be excited to see these next year, too, because this is the f- really the first year, I feel like, where the, where the two of them have been really on par. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that uh, the, the two consoles are, are, are kind of humming along. They've had a series of updates, and I feel like for the most part, they've pretty much delivered on everything that they initially said they were going to. Like, they finally kind of, like, we finally kind of have the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 that we were promised, I guess. Yep. And, you know, so obviously we're, we're starting to get really good games from developers now. Like, you know, the, we're really starting to see what the platforms can do. So, yeah, it, it, it is like a really interesting, it's really interesting to kind of look ahead from this point and see how these, two consoles are going to go. And I think that a big, big draw for both of these uh, are their free games programs. And in terms of the value that you get, I mean, like we just laid it out, like, you know, 900, almost a thousand dollars on the Xbox side, over a thousand dollars worth of games on the PlayStation side. I'm on Amazon right now, an Xbox live 12 month gold membership, $55 PlayStation plus one year membership, $50. But so, again, to be fair, cause this is exactly what Sony and Microsoft will do. Yeah, they say a thousand. You get a thousand dollars worth of free games, but that's if you own all three platforms. Very good point. Very, very good point. Right. So it's not. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, not, not not to not to negate the fact that like you pay fifty bucks, and not only do you get other things like infrastructure, and you get some like TV shows on PlayStation, whatever. Yeah. But um um, and I'm sure you still on the PS4 end up getting you know four hundred dollars or more worth of. Uh, worth of uh, you know games or whatever, right? But the thou- to get the thousand or to get the nine hundred and fifty on Xbox, you've got to have all three, right? Or both yeah. platforms, yeah, yeah. So just which just which, I ha- which I happen to have, but uh, so I'm I'm lucky in that sense that I can. Do you I can play really them kinda... actively? Do you go download the, the free games the, on PS3? I play the PlayStation Three the least. I, I can't remember the last time I actually fired up a PlayStation Three game from the um you know from from like the free the free monthly games right and that's what I'm like do you even go Most, download them do you go add cuz once you have to add them yeah. to your library during the month yeah like i add them to my library and then uh, most of the most of the stuff i end up playing is usually on the vita uh just because i tend to i tend to be a little bit more curious about the stuff they put out on the vita uh and also because i've been playing metal gear solid 5 for like 4 months straight or whatever <laughs> yes so. but anyway yeah, it's it's a very interesting comparison, and, and thanks, Brent, for bringing those those two articles forward. I think it's a a really interesting topic, and I'm curious to see how it plays out in 2016. Yeah do you do you think is the are the free game programs is that a solid reason to to have like the PSN Plus or the Xbox Live Gold membership? Like like do those remain an important part of the ecosystem for you, or is it just an added bonus that you could kind of live without or no, no, it's, I don't know Take if I can live with, I don't know about living without it, but it's in it for, I mean, I think, you know, at the end of the day, I think people are, are, are paying 
that money for the multiplayer experience, basically. Yeah. Um, I, See, there's... I'm I'm paying it basically for the free games. Well, I don't, I, I don't play multiplayer that much, so for me, I have to say that like my PSN Plus membership is basically the free games. I well, and that, I can understand that, that because library. for fifty bucks you get a year's worth of games, and I think yeah. for people that that uh, you know, a lot of these games I've played by the time they come out because. Mm-hmm. You know, because of the show, we sort of imbibe games voraciously, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too, uh, on the road, but uh, or into the sunset. But uh, um, so I think it can have value. And I was thinking about my, you know, eleven-year-old nephew who doesn't have a ton of money to buy games or whatever. He could invest in fifty bucks into one game, or he could invest this fifty bucks and get a couple of games every month all year long. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, it's 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 a big enough added bonus that it makes me never ever ever question the 50 bucks i'm spending right for playstation that's, plus that's a good way of putting it yeah. and honestly i mean i guess i don't really play a ton of multiplayer on the playstation either a ton i mean i rocket, I, league. rocket league i do but i didn't i don't play first person shooters almost ever uh on the uh on the console or whatever and so it's just it's just enough to make me never question spending that 50 bucks and and i think that i think that that's ultimately what what it what it really boils down to for sony and microsoft i think it's it's a value add. It's you, you know they, they have this service that they want you to pay for. There's some crucial things like multiplayer, but they don't want you. To, I, I think that they don't want you to go into that uh, that transaction saying, "Well, you're twisting my arm, making you know this the only way that I can have multiplayer." They want you to go into it smiling and really happy, and so they're they're going to give you a bunch of stuff to uh, to help the medicine go down. Well, it certainly does. And let me tell you, for $1,000 worth of games, I will swallow whatever you want. Yes, I said it. And That's I'm not actually, sorry. I'm it's not actually sorry. a true story, people. <laughs> All right, everybody. Let's hit the road and talk about some of the games we're playing this week. Lauren, what you got first? Yeah, we're not going to be on the road very long, Brent. <laughs> Uh, because I played That's two fine, games because I don't like traveling during the holidays. Two games anyhow. this week, and uh, I uh, I posted about this in the website because I'm not happy, Brent. I'm not happy. I what won't are you lie. not happy about? <sighs> Let's start with Star Wars Battlefront. Okay, I which, thought you were happy with Star Wars Battlefront. I you was were, happy with Star Wars Battlefront. You were out there defending it last you know last couple of weeks, talking uh, about how it's the shit and all that. It is the shit and all that, and then they put out this uh, free DLC <laughs> that they talked about, the Battle Uh-oh. of Jakku. Uh oh. Uh, which came out a week early for people that pre-ordered uh, or paid yeah. forty-four cents. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and then everybody, and then everybody got it on December eighth. Yeah. And I don't know what happened, man, but something. So number one, they did something really stupid, which is they treated it like it was actual add-on content. So instead of just inserting it into the game, yeah. you have to select whether or not you want to play the main game or you want to include the Jakku DLC. And so oh, you kind of come on, that's a terrible. Idea. You kind of split the community that way if you don't pick the right button. But either way, terrible. something happened on the on the you know there's no server browser on the PC side, and so, something mm-hmm. happened in the matchmaking that you literally oh. can't find games. It's unplayable. Oh, yeah. I can't play the game. No, that's they terrible. Broke it. They literally broke it. And for for last four or five days, I have been unable to play Star Wars Battlefront because. <laughs> and, and there's articles you can you can go on the web uh, and look. There's there's a um, there's uh, there's articles about it on the web. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Fucking EA. It's just absolutely broken. And so I talked about how I really this was like the best EA that's launch crazy. of a multiplayer game I had ever played. It was getting into matches with seamless. For about seamless. two weeks. <laughs> yeah, and then they, I, I can't even, I can't believe they broke it after the fact. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, so, so there you go. So I'm telling you, we're not going to be on the road very long this week. Uh, I played about 10 minutes of Star Wars Battlefront, and it's unplayable. Literally unplayable Literally at this unplayable. Point. Well, look, if you're looking to get a, a Star Wars experience, and obviously uh, you're not going to get it through Battlefront, might I suggest Star Wars Commander, <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, which I got back into. I, I didn't play Metal Gear this week just because it was a, it's been a really, really busy week uh, getting ready for the holidays. My family's coming to visit and everything, you know, so that we got a lot to do, and I haven't played Metal Gear. But I did come back to Star Wars Commander. They they did an update. Well, I mean, you know, they've been updating the game constantly. I've been away for months now, but I went back and just thought I would check it out again and see what all's changed. And it's really interesting to see how it's evolved in my absence. And uh, one of the things that they had just introduced when I kind of fell off playing was uh, different planets. You can relocate your base to different worlds now, like like Tatooine and Hoth are available to me right now. 
and then you can unlock other worlds through gameplay and and you know that that'll change up that you know it doesn't really change the game mechanics too much but it changes the scenery it makes it a little bit less monotonous there's new music cues and things like that that uh that, that are you know fun but it is interesting how they how they've begun to tweak the gameplay mechanics and things like that one of the things is they now have these they now have these these challenges which it is not too dissimilar from like something like Fallout Shelter. Like remember in Fallout Shelter, you'd have like these these challenges, things like oh you know extinguish twelve vault fires or collect uh, seventeen outfits, and then when you did that, you'd either get like a cash reward or you'd get a lunchbox or something. And uh, Star Wars Commander started doing something like that. So you know now when you're doing your your multiplayer. Uh, battles and things with other players you're trying to do things like destroy 180 turrets construct 17 vehicles of any type and things like that and when you when you do that you'll get basically a mystery crate and you know the crate opens and you know you'll get you know some kind of unlockable or uh you know maybe maybe you'll get uh you know like a cash infusion or you know some some sort of some sort of reward and, and they're pretty good i mean like it's you know, like two hundred thousand currency and that kind of stuff that I've gotten so far. But anyway, it's it's a good it's a good idea. It's a good mechanic to keep people interested in playing and to give them big rewards for uh, uh, extended extended play, not just you know coming to the game every couple of days. So I think uh, I think they've done some good stuff. That's awesome. Uh, I, you know, it would be nice to get online and play a Star Wars experience that that works. Yes, yes, it certainly would be. Uh, what about Just Cause 3? I'm, Just I'm sh- all right. So like I said, Brent, we're not going to be on the road very long, and here's another reason why. Okay. Uh, Just Cause 3 also doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't played much of the old JC3. Waiting for, uh, waiting for an update on JC3. Uh, you know Can what? I get an update? Yeah. I, I will, I will, that was beautiful, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will just wait as long as I have to to just play it. I, you know, I, so... It, Whatever, I'm just waiting. I, I, I played it for very little time this week. You're losing your mind. I'm just waiting. I don't know what uh, else to say. Well, let's go ahead and write Into the Sunset, Lauren, since there's not much in the way of gaming to talk about. What is your Into the Sunset story? You know what is going to work, Brent? What's that? No question. I Absolutely, when it's released, I, it's going to work without fail. Virtual reality, that's what. <laughs> you know, you said it a little bit like Walter's soap check there. You're like, let me tell you something else, dude. I've seen a lot of spiles in my time, and this guy walks. <laughs> I've never been more sure of anything in my life. There was there, a little bit of that vibe in it there. There is there is almost no chance there will be any technical issues <laughs> with, with the launch reality. of virtual reality. <laughs> Um, but, uh, no, millions uh, of gamers won't be hanging over their balconies, puking into the alleyways below <laughs> because they right. don't have their inner ocular distance set up correctly or some bullshit. Um, like that. So what I'm bringing to you today is the cover of the January issue of a uh, game informer titled the year of VR. And it talks about, I actually went out and bought the issue. Uh, I haven't read it yet. Um, but, or I haven't read all of it yet, but, uh, uh, it's basically uh, a breakdown of what's coming up in the in the next in 2016 for virtual reality. And as we know, the Vive uh, got pushed into uh, 2016. Supposedly, still no release date yet, but Oculus Rift supposedly Q1 2015 2016. So uh, yeah, man, I'm really excited. You know, I'm excited about it. Just had to give it a shout out and check out the article on Game Informer if you're interested. I would. Uh, I'm definitely interested, and I look forward to checking this article out. Excellent. What about you, man? My end of the sunset is uh, is a really really cool story from slate dot com. You may or may not be aware that Ralph Bear is often considered the father of video games. That's a uh, you know th- that's something that lots of history of video game specials have touched on at one time or another. But what you might not be aware of is some of the really really fascinating history behind Ralph Bear and how he came to be the father of video games and slate has this uh, this really great write-up titled How a World War II Refugee Became the Father of Video Games. Ralph Baer was a German Jew who fled Nazi Germany with his family just prior to things getting really, really bad in uh, in that country. And he uh, he came to the United States. He was uh, you know, a really innovative guy and uh and and had had a, had a very keen mind he was largely self educated uh although he did serve uh he served in the United States Army during World War II obviously speaking german uh, that was a that was a very 
<laughs> that was a very valuable asset. And uh, he went to college on the GI Bill after the war ended. And this article just goes through all of these these interesting things that happened to him along the way and how he, he eventually began to get this idea about interactive television, something that was happening on a television screen that you could interact with and how this idea eventually led to the first video game console. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a really, really remarkable story about a pretty remarkable guy who is a very important figure in this industry and hobby that we call gaming. So I highly recommend that you go uh, check out this article from Slate.com. Take a few minutes to get through, but it will be a fun ride, I guarantee. I just want to be clear that my people not only invented movies, but we also invented video games. That's right, and you kept, <laughs> I'm just and you kept the rest of us out of it, didn't you? Yeah, I'm just, you just hoarded it for yourself. And I haven't seen one damn penny of it. <laughs> All right, uh, Brent. Heading you, into the you uh, and me both, buddy. Heading into the ride along, uh, we have something from uh, listener Blue Fire Four Thousand. Right, Blue Fire asks us. He says, "I have a question for you." He or she, I don't know. Says, I have a question for our uh, outlaw overlords, lawless leaders, hellish hosts. I like all those. Man, what do we call you guys? Never mind. That's not my question. My question is, how much obligation do you feel to us, your audience, to purchase and play big games as they come out so you can talk about them on the show? As a follow-up, would you see any worth in a website that purposefully reviewed games three months after they are out? Would this lead to more objective review free objective? Reviews free of hype and launch shenanigans, or would it be irrelevant because everybody moved on to the next shiny game? So, excellent uh, questions. A couple of questions there. I thought it would be good to give you guys a little peek behind the curtains or whatever. We don't, mm. we don't often get questions about the show, so I thought you might enjoy hearing about it. Um, I think Brent and I actually have a, I don't know, I, I think we have a bit of a different relationship to this first question. Um, we but, do now, yeah. Uh, well, certainly now that you have a daughter, uh, your priorities are yes. just completely I w- screwed up. But I was going to say that prior to becoming a father, I did feel I did feel uh, a certain obligation to to try and and you know play games as they came out and stay current so that we could talk about it on the show. But since my daughter was born, I, I haven't uh, I haven't made that as much of a priority. I've just I, I've resigned myself to the fact that I'm going to play games when I can get to them. And that being the case, I tend to prioritize the games that I have great personal interest in. Therefore, all of the responsibility falls on me. That's true. Uh, no, no. Uh, I do feel a sense of uh, responsibility to a, to one degree or another. I mean, uh, I I do tend to um, we do we do. I, I think we both want to to be able to talk about the games, and we will certainly in, in uh, frequently in a season like this. If Brent's getting a certain game, I may get another game, so we can talk about both of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I do play probably a lot more games than I would if I weren't doing the show because I feel like. Uh, uh, you know, we want to talk about them. That's the point of this show is to talk about them and to, to have a forum for talking about them. So yeah, I do feel a, um, um, I do feel a sense of responsibility to play them, but I also enjoy playing them. So, uh, that's not a bad thing. Uh, as to your second question, uh, as a follow up, would I, would we see any worth in a website that purposely reviewed games three months after they are out? Um, you know, I've never thought about that before. My first reaction is, is probably not only because I do think that people, uh, by and large, will have moved on. Um, but that's the world we live in right now, Brent. That, I mean, that's the world you and I occupy, being on a, a, a show, uh, being constantly looking at the website. I think I live in a world where the people around us that we interact with are frequently looking for information on day one. I don't know. What do you think, Brent? I think that you and I are the guys that did a postmortem on Batman Arkham City over a year after it came out. and And therefore, we may not be the best people to answer this question in any sort of objective or knowledgeable way. That's Actually, that's think. a good point. And we're, we're probably going to be the people that do a postmortem on uh, Deus Ex, uh, you know, five <laughs> years after, <laughs> after it comes out. That shit's never going to happen. Stop teasing me. <laughs> Why do I bring that up? Why do I bring that up? Because you're a bastard. I am a bastard. All right. It's a great question, Blue Fire. Thanks for, uh, for bringing those out to us. Um, I think, Brett, that's going to bring us to the end of the show. Yes, it will. And with that, we ask you guys to participate in the comments section and sound off on anything you have to say about the topics we discussed today, whether it's Ralph Bear, the Year of VR, Just Cause 3, Star Wars Commander, Star Wars Battlefront, um, the comparison up at the clubhouse between the PlayStation Plus and Xbox Games with Gold free games that were given out in 2015, or what we talked about up in the garage, Uncharted 4's dialogue options, 
the new uh, amazingly beautiful game Way to the Woods or the release date of Rise of the Tomb Raider on PC. Please sound off on those topics or anything related to gaming as usual. He is Brent Adams and I am Lauren Baumgart. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. <laughs>